Hey folks, it's Matt Carlson from PhD Going Industry, and today I want to talk to you about three reasons why you should think about becoming a data analyst and three obstacles that you might face on your way on that path. The first reason is the pay. Data analysts don't make a crazy amount of money, um, but it is in line with what professors make and definitely more than a postdoc. The average starting salary for a data analyst can be anywhere from 65k to 95k depending on experience and the industry that they're going into. The second reason to becoming a data analyst is the career progression that you can have in your work. So a few years after being a data analyst you're able to apply for jobs that are at a senior data analyst level and those uh, the pay for those can range anywhere from 90k to well into six figures, potentially up to 150k or higher. Additionally, you can go in two other directions as well. You can go into management and lead a team of data analysts and often make six figures doing that. And if you like the more technical aspects of being a data analyst, you can go into data science which is more on the programming end and on the creating the pipelines uh, for data getting funneled in and built into warehouses, basically setting up shop for data analysts to use. So you have a couple different ways you can go. Again, you can go towards a, a senior position where you may be mentoring other students, taking on more difficult projects. You can go into a leadership position where you're managing a team of data analysts, or you can go into a more technically rigorous area like data science. The third reason that I think being a data analyst is a great option for grad students is that there are many industries that need data analyst work. The three greatest industries right now, or the three biggest, are business, marketing, and healthcare. Healthcare is the field that I work in, and that worked out great because that was a match for the work that I did in grad school. But there are far more industries than just that. You can go into uh, merchandising, you can go into various aspects of the business world, even nonprofits use data analysts for their work. The need for data analysts is expected to continue growing, so I think the opportunities in many industries will continue to grow as the years grow on and data becomes much more of a uh, central position in companies being used to help make decisions within the company. So let's talk about three obstacles that you may encounter to becoming a data analyst. The first obstacle is that you're inevitably going to need to learn a new programming, uh, coding, or statistical language. Most grad students will learn thing, how to use programs like SPSS, sometimes SAS. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll learn how to use R. But those programs are often not used in the business world in data analyst work. The most common language that's used is SQL, or also known as SQL. And SQL stands for Structured Querying Language. It's essentially a language that allows you to access data from multiple, what are called tables, or large data sets, and bring them all together. And this kind of uh, the data warehousing is very common in the business world where you have just enormous volumes of data that you have kept over the years. And whenever it's time to actually run some numbers, you have to access data from multiple places and bring them together using common keys or IDs across those data sets. So, SQL is probably a language that you're going to have to learn to become a data analyst in the industry. That being said, some companies do use other programs. For example, occasionally I use SAS in my work as a data analyst in the healthcare industry. I've heard many people say that they use R, although R is probably more common among smaller companies uh, compared to enterprise companies. Uh, because R is free, which is great if you're a smaller company looking to keep your costs low. Uh, the downside is it's open source, which means it's a little bit more vulnerable and open to attack uh, compared to some of the large, more enterprise softwares 
like SAS and SQL. Another language that you may need to learn at some point is Python. So Python is both a program that can be used for statistics, kind of like R, um, and at the same time it can be used for things more like coding, uh, like more of like software development-esque activities. And so it's a little less commonly used for data analytics, um, although there are some companies that do use Python and I have seen it on uh, job descriptions. Which brings me to a great point. If you know the industry that you want to go in, just go ahead and start looking at job descriptions and figure out what kind of programs are typically used by people in your industry. Again, Python, SQL, and R are probably the most common ones you'll see with SQL being the most common of those. So the next obstacle that you may encounter when transitioning to becoming a data analyst in industry is creating a portfolio. So a portfolio is simply an online depiction of a project that you've completed that has something to do with data analysis. Typically it involves showing graphs of the data, basically just like visualizations that can be done in R or a visualizer like Tableau or Power BI. And you also want to be able to show the code that you built in order to run the uh, program or the the little analysis part of your project uh, to basically show that you can actually do the coding. Most times you'll be using a publicly available data set uh, to analyze and produce these results because obviously you don't want to use private data from say uh, a research lab that didn't want you to put the data out there or a business that you know obviously they want to keep their data in-house. But there's tons of publicly available data uh, that can be used for portfolio projects. So, why should you consider doing a portfolio project? I encounter a little bit of a, I encounter a mindset from grad students that essentially goes along the lines of, I've done all this work to get a PhD, I've been in school for years, I've, you know, grinded in order to hone my skills, and I know that my skills are relevant to industry, even though I may not have years of experience with the platform or the stats package or coding language they want me to use. Why do I need to do more free work in order to get a job? And I understand that feeling, but I would pitch it in maybe a little different way. Think about it from the recruiter's perspective. Their job is to find a solid candidate who meets the requirements and is someone who will be a good fit with the company and not leave anytime soon. There are a lot of folks who come out of undergrad and go straight into a job in industry where they are learning these skills every day. And when you take your PhD, and let's say you have a lot of skills in data analytics, you go into the free market and try to get one of these jobs in industry, you're going to be going up against people who have gotten, let's say, a bachelor's in computer programming or uh, something business related having to do with analytics. And they may have three, five, or seven years experience in industry doing the job. They may not know the level of statistics that you do, uh, but they've actually done the job. And to recruiters, they are going to look like a safer bet because they've actually done the job. They've been in roles in industry before. And, you know, assuming that they were uh, good at the job and a decent team player, they'll stay for years. And recruiters love to see someone who stayed in a job for years. Um, because again, that'll be a win for their company, even if that person may not have the, uh, you know, theorizing skills that you do when it comes to turning data into theory or insights. They may not have the advanced statistical knowledge you have, but they've actually done the job and they're a safer bet. So what does that have to do with portfolios? Portfolios are a way where you can meet recruiters in the middle. You can meet them halfway and you can say, hey, I know that I'm kind of coming out of left field. I'm coming out of grad school into industry. I may not have any experience in industry, but I have all the skills needed to do it. And I'm willing to do the work to show you that I can do this job. And it, it's a way of addressing 
experience gaps and skill gaps. Experience gaps are where you don't have something in your professional experiences section on your resume that shows that you've actually done the job that people are hiring for. Skill gaps are where you, you, know, you don't actually have the years of experience using SQL uh, that recruiters may be looking for when they're hiring for a position. And so the portfolio is a great thing to be able to point recruiters to, to say, hey, look, I've, I can do this job. I'll show you I can do similar activities, similar projects with data that's relevant to your industry. And it'll help you get a foot in the door and get that first conversation with the recruiter. And then, you know, you can go from there. You can answer the questions well, turn the charm on, so on and so forth, and go to the next stage of interviews. But you're never going to get to that second stage of interviews if you can't convince recruiters that you can do the job. And when they see skill gaps and experience gaps, they're gonna wanna, they're gonna want some, um, they're gonna want something to build their confidence in you. And a portfolio is a great way to go about it. So the last obstacle you may encounter to becoming a data analyst is humility. And this is something that I experienced uh, head on right when I got my first job. Not only do you need to accept the humility of I have a PhD, yet I have to learn all these skills and upskill before entering the job market to obtain a job that uh, you know people without my degree are getting you're gonna get into a position at some point where you're working with people who don't have a PhD uh, you will work with people who have an undergrad degree who know more than you do who probably make more than you do and who have more power and influence in the company than you and this is a hundred percent okay and I, I think it took me a while to kind of like gain some perspective on this um, but as a grad student you chose to go down the path of taking on more education rather than going into industry and gaining direct experience and those who went into industry and gained direct experience should be rewarded for taking that path and it's, it's not fair to expect that you as a grad student be able to come in and have the, you know, the best title, the highest wages, and um, you know, just be readily embraced in the companies simply because you have a PhD, simply because you've been published or cited, um, simply because you've learned advanced statistical techniques. Embracing the humility of starting over is really part of the cornerstone of taking your PhD to industry. And I think it is true. I think you are starting over by going to industry. But I don't think starting over is a bad thing. And I think that it's something to be embraced rather than something to be resisted. So if you are ready to take your PhD to industry, I recommend you find a roadmap to doing that. And the easiest way to do that is to download my six-week checklist that goes over six steps that you need to do, one step per week, in order to be prepared and launch a great career search and get a job in industry. Again, you can find that on my website at sixweekchecklist.com, and you can download it there, print it off, start filling it out, and get prepared to be applying to jobs in the industry and get calls from recruiters. Thank you all, see you all next time.